Uh... All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle. It's great to be with you. Today we're going to be talking about Rimzo Martinez's path to libertarianism. Very excited to talk to him. Very interesting guy. And I think you'll really enjoy the conversation. Stay tuned right after this. Warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. If you struggle to understand politics, we explain it from an independent libertarian point of view with all of the irreverence it deserves. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, Chris Spangle, a 15-year veteran of politics and media. Welcome to the program. It's great to see you today and, uh, to, well, to be heard, I guess. Uh, we're not seeing anybody right now in this horrible, horrible pandemic. But today we've got something a little more fun, a little more lighthearted than all of that doom and gloom. We have one of my favorite people on earth, one of the co-hosts, well, one of the hosts here on the We Are Libertarians podcast network. His show is On The Run with Rimzo Martinez, which you can get at wearelibertarians.com. Rimzo, thank you for joining me. How are you today? Chris, I'm doing great. You mean we're not going to just go ahead and talk about the dun, dun, dark winter? Uh, I've wanted to say that all week. It sounds like something straight out of a comic. Coming this fall, done, done. The We Are Libertarians crossover event of the millennia, Dark Winter. It would be depressing and sad because Chris Spangle will be there. There's nothing new on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that's true. Uh, there, we've reached the point where I predicted we'd get here. And that it would be, there'd be an annoying amount of these services and you'd end up paying monthly what you pay for cable. You might as well just get cable, pay the $200 a month because you have so many darn monthly subscriptions. Like I, I don't even know what Peacock is, but I got to get it now because I like the office. It's, it's very, is there like a comic book version of that? Uh, there are, and not all of them are great. Uh, I host a show with Mark Claire called the second print comics podcast. And the annoying thing with that was there are only so many comics we can physically own or buy. <laughs> so we, we've got a few apps like Marvel unlimited where we can get all the new Marvel comics, except they rotate things out pretty fast. And usually by the time something is out, it's usually a bit dated. And then we wonder, do we really want to talk about it? And then there's another service called hoopla, which for some people it'll make their ears bleed because it's basically serviced through the public libraries where you just get a library card and you can access digital comics for free. And then you've got others like Comixology. But I, I got to tell you, Chris, there's nothing like actually physically holding one in your hands. I will be a comic book Luddite for as long as humanly possible until they stop printing them. Yeah, I really love my Kindle. I love reading on the Kindle. It's easy, especially in bed. But like I will like a book. I like a physical mm -hmm. paper book. I get I get the Wall Street Journal delivered in, in print form. You know, it's amazing that the tech, I was thinking about this the other day, the whole tech revolution of which you're very familiar. Uh, we'll talk about your day job in a moment. But, you know, looking back 10 years ago, we thought, oh, it's going to, all these things are going to die. Broadcast will go away. You work for the Washington Times, uh, a physical print newspaper. Like we, we thought all this stuff was going away. And of course, it's been hard hit by the pandemic or by the uh, <laughs> but the pandemic of the internet. Um, but a lot of this stuff still remains. It's still here. It's still, uh, you know, there's as many books sold as there was, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, it's it, Radio is, is strong. Like, have we kind of reached a point, a plateau in terms of the, the fall off of all that stuff? I, I think we're at the point now where we're starting to redefine the purpose of a lot of this stuff. It used to be that if you want something easily accessible that you don't have to put a battery in, you get a book instead of a Kindle e-reader. Uh, now, what was interesting when, when I was back in media at the Washington Times, we actually made a majority of our profit from uh, ad solicitations and from the classified section. But we still had very reliable and growing uh, print readership 
uh, between 2019 and 2020. I think 2019 was actually the best year on record for the Washington Times. And Mm -hmm. what I learned from many people, especially primarily college students and people who were going for post-grad work between, you know, Georgetown, Washington University, and all the other major colleges in D.C., uh, they would tell me that they would read the newspaper because there were no pop-ups. (laughs) <laughs> and I thought that was I thought that was funny, but like that's a that's a legitimate thing. Like they know that when they pick up their paper and they start actually reading it, it's just them and the text. Yeah. And that's that sounds kind of frivolous to some people, but when I sat back and I listened to it, I'm like, that that makes a lot of sense because I was very much the same way. I graduated from Liberty University in 2017, and between uh, my my two years of undergrad there at 16 and uh, 15 through 17, uh, I had a a print subscription to the to the Wall Street Journal. Now we needed it for a foreign policy class and the political economy class I was taking, so usually we would reference the articles in uh on on the website but what i found was one of my favorite parts of the day was getting some coffee or grabbing lunch and pulling out the paper and actually reading the commentary section and what i found was funny was i would go to class and i'd have my paper in my bag or under my arm and people would ask hey are you done reading it could i have it and i'm like sure never in a million years i think i get more than one person uh especially around my age asking to have a use newspaper but i i totally i totally get it now and i think books have the same function i think a lot of things do now and you know whether they maintain a significant share of the of the consumer market space i i I used to think if you asked me this probably a few years ago i would say that they're going to be phased out within the next 10 years now i don't think i'll say that i don't think they're going to be phased out this century unless something significant changes i mean now they're sell now they're selling books made out of recyclable goods yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. So I think we're going to continue to redefine the purpose of these things to keep them lasting longer than before. I think we're going to see an upcharge with it, but I don't see them disappearing like I would have probably thought a couple of years ago. Well, I want to jump back because the point of the path to libertarianism is to talk about somebody's development. And you've had a, a, a weird, interesting career in some some of the similar ways that That's I have. such a polite way to put it. Well, between being an author and being a podcast host, a columnist, working for newspapers, working for parlor, like, you know, there's there's all kinds of and that's why on the run is such a fun show is because you don't you don't just stick to politics. You talk about all kinds of different things before we jump into like your development as a libertarian. Like, tell us about on the run. What do you do there? What's the show like and where can people get it on the run was supposed to be a travel show funny that i say it now because as soon as it came out as soon as i was planning for it everything was put in lockdown so uh for for listeners chris and i were discussing where the show was kind of going and i immediately as soon as virginia and dc and the rest of the east coast were shutting down i i really had to understand like no one's gonna listen to travel because there's not there's nowhere to freaking travel to right. so i quickly had to uh refocus it and i started really asking like what is the point of traveling what is the journey what is the discovery and ultimately on the run is a culmination of every project everything i've ever done in the past uh decade or so it's everything i've done in and out of politics because ultimately i I think i've had the the luck or in some cases the misfortune of casting myself as a millennial forrest gump i've done a lot of a lot of things i met a lot of people i've had a lot of crazy opportunities so the focus of on the run is discovering the wider world around you through different people through different means of you know looking at the world around you and how you can find your place on earth and your place in the grander universe and also just having a lot of damn fun because ultimately it's a it's a show about the travel of life the focus of life um you know i do everything from talking to people that work at morgues to talking to elected officials about uh stoic philosophy to talking with anybody and everything in between because i think we get so caught up in in the box mentality you know we're just looking at one screen so that way we could take our time and go look at another screen we're constantly be told told who we are and what we believe and where we should keep our focus that we ignore this amazing world around us so on the run came from the mentality of listen we gotta be on the run from everyone else that's telling us what to do and we gotta think for ourselves and explore that and, you know, by having really what I deem as a non-political show on a political network, it refocuses people because the world is a big place. It's an incredibly big place. And the fault that I had as a young adult was thinking that 
one, not only did everything revolve around me, but that my world was super small and I was incapable of escaping it. Um, so really it's, it's trying to just rediscover that part of life. And ultimately what, what I do also is I throw in, um, you know, strategies, lectures and other stuff that I do. I, I've worked with clients, uh, from politics and nonprofits and everything else to basically help people achieve more freedom. This week we had an episode. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know when this is coming out, but recently we had an episode called why should you blog on medium versus Substack? how to build a campaign, uh, whether you're running for dog catcher or governor in 24 hours, how to start a side hustle. It's trying to understand what are the things that can help you achieve more options and more freedom in your life. So by exploring the world around you, by developing the skills that you can learn to go ahead and expand your options, I, I think uh, On The Run has a little bit of everything for everyone, and I've had one hell of a time doing it. Yeah, like I, I, my favorite one was about uh, being a freelance journalist. You know, that one really spoke to me, but there's all kinds of the other one that I loved was the the story of a drunken escapade about stealing Alexander Hamilton's pistol. Uh, that was so, one of the most wild interviews I've ever done in my life. <laughs> wide ranging interview. It's really, really interesting. So it, it's like a fun variety show that uh, you never know what you're going to get week to week. Like if you were to recommend one episode to start with or your personal favorite, where would you, where would you recommend people dive in? Oh, I mean, and, and I think this is fun for libertarians and non-libertarians alike. I just like to have a good time. I have a, I have a segment of the show called the degenerate panel where I bring in my friends, uh, Sean, Zed and Derek. I've known them since I was like 12 years old. And, uh, we basically look at areas of pop culture that shaped who we are as millennials. And I think one of our favorite episodes was, a uh, degenerate theater, looking at movies that are so bad, they're actually good right and you know people often think you know everything has to be somewhat politically tilted i'm pretty sure that among my friends i'm actually the only libertarian or self-identifying libertarian on the panel but the purpose is to remember the things that we enjoy and remember that there's there, there's beauty to the world around us and you know we're, we're movie nerds we're gamers we're comic book nerds getting getting to experience that together and for two hours on a thursday night uh, you know, get to share that with you. I think that's an episode. It's one. It's one of my best performing episodes. But I mean, people people like being able to just jump back and remember the things that are just genuinely funny without an agenda. Yeah, absolutely. So let's jump back to Baby Remzo. Uh, you you were on a We Are Libertarians episode and talked a lot about your your background, um, and that was this summer. Go check that out. But I, I wish I knew the episode number. But you know, have you always been political? Have you always been a libertarian? Like, what was your family of origin like? Like, when it came to your passion for politics, was that something that your family was into, or did you come by it on your own? It was. It, it was something that I, I, I kind of got folded into, and I, I, I got a pitch, or else it'd be terrible. Like, I, I, I cover all this in my first book, "Stay Away from the Libertarians." It's a comedic uh, history of the modern libertarian movement post Ron Paul. And, uh, you know, ultimately it starts with this, like, I didn't like people telling me what to do in school, whether they were teachers or other students. And it got to the point where I realized that uh, politics wasn't just becoming something that was of interest to me. It was becoming the general pop culture. I mean, uh, Barack Obama, love him or hate him, he was a pop culture president in the way that Bill Clinton was, in the way that, and, and people might disagree with me on this, I think Richard Nixon was. And I think it really goes back to Teddy Roosevelt, who was the first one to bring reporters into the White House. And, uh, you know, it was that fusion of like this postmodern progressive ideology that really began to show me that, you know, we talk about free expression. We talk about, you know, free speech and all this other stuff. But the, I, feel, I felt like the academic institutions around me were becoming more and more restrictive. And I had a kind of a strange upbringing. I was homeschooled, public schooled and private schooled off and on like it just depended where we were i came i come from an active military family uh i, I moved to australia right when um the invasion of iraq occurred in 2003 and ironically saddam hussein was captured on my birthday mm -hmm. so I, I i always you know i get to share that with history 
But, uh, you know, I had kids that would repeat what their parents were saying. And, and this isn't in the book. I actually think this is the first time I bring it up. But, like, um, you know, ki kids are mean. And suddenly, you know, it's like, hey, uh, George Bush is invading Iraq. What the hell is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't even know who George Bush is. <laughs> like, I was I was like seven at the time. So, you know, when, when I came back to the United States uh, in 2005, it was just starting to get to that point now where, you know, the – Everything on TV is just going after George Bush and my my family, uh, you know, pretty, pretty cut and dry Republicans. We just kind of watch it. And we're just like, well, you know, there, there's more to life than this. And then, you know, when I moved to Virginia in 2007, right around the time that uh, Barack Obama was the Democratic uh, nominee, it just came to a point where things were just getting really weird. And flash forward to 2012, I'm in a I'm an AP government class and we're given extra credit if we work on a campaign, any campaign. And, you know, at this point, I'm watching uh, Tea Party rallies literally outside of my door. We went to Glenn Beck's rally to restore honor. At this point, I'm starting to see like, you know, there's something there's something going on in the country. And I feel this fervor to be part of it. But then, you know, at this point, I'm like, OK, I'll go volunteer for Mitt Romney because I genuinely believe in some of this stuff. And I also want the class credit. I start really assessing, you know, wh who am I? What do I really believe? And I start looking at Mitt Romney and I'm like. This guy's a white Obama. What the hell? <laughs> so before I could knock on a single door, make a single phone call, I just ghosted. I don't, I don't end up getting the extra credit or anything. And after that, um, you know, the, the world just got weird. I ended up running for president of our uh, school's Young Republican Club. It had like 60 members. And I lost by like three votes. And the guy who won was the secretary of the Young Democrats. And the overall consensus was we need to be more liberal because obviously conservatism and everything has been repudiated. So I, I do what any, um, you know, teen with an existential crisis does at that point. I start Googling things. Uh, I start, you know, Googling. Join the libertarian movement. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing all these guys like Rothbard and Mises. And I'm like, who are all these Australian dudes? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I didn't even know what Austria was. I was that dumb. And, uh, you know, at that point, I start learning. I start learning about Thomas Massey, Justin the Mosh, um, all this other stuff. And then what I realized was it's like, you know. I'm, I'm kind of in the minority on a lot of these things with a lot of different people. I should just let it take its course. And at that point, I go off to college, uh, join Students for Liberty, get to meet all the fabulous furry freak brothers there. Loved it. Was a campus coordinator. Uh, got an internship at Freedom Works. Stayed on as a education reform researcher for a little bit, blogging about that stuff. And uh, life just went in 20 million different directions. I, I was a... I was a campaign consultant. I staffed and uh, consulted for libertarian candidates, in, uh, independent candidates, Republicans. I did I did journalism for a bit. Uh, jumped around between that and media. Started a podcast called the Remsa Republic. Um, and you know, part of my podcasting journey came from listening to We Are Libertarians when I was a freshman in college in Alabama, and I would drive from the small town of Marion, where the military school was, that I went to to Tuscaloosa, which was two and a half hours away, and you had a show about libertarianism that was about two and a half hours long. So between that and Lions for Liberty, I had a lot of free time on my hands. But yeah. ultimately, you know, where where life has taken me now, it's gotten to the point where uh, my my passions and my professions are almost one in the same. And that comes with a lot of pros and that comes with a lot of cons. But ultimately, uh, we, we have a choice. And I don't think there's a wrong choice for people. But we have to ultimately determine where are we going to spend our time and energy. Because if we're going to spend uh, enough time being angry about something, we might as well try and be the solutions to it. So I'm, I'm at the point now where uh, I've done a lot of a lot of things. I've messed with a little bit of many other things and, uh, you know on the run and everything else I do is really, really just a whole hodgepodge of all of that. Yeah. You have a wide and varied set of interests and you and I, I feel are, are kind of the most kindred spirits in the, in the whole libertarian movement. I've like known Mark Claire the longest. I'd consider him probably my best libertarian podcast buddy, other than the people on my own network. Um, Mark Claire, I mean, Mark Claire and, and uh, Johnny Adams, they taught me how to podcast. Yeah. Like you know, they taught I'm, me buy this microphone, go on here, do yeah. this, don't do that. Like it was, um, you know, it, they they really took me under their wing. And I, I mean, I was thinking about Johnny's show last night. I don't, I don't know if he's still producing a podcast. I hope he is because his uh, the launch pad 
or what was Johnny Rocket? What was it called before the Johnny launch? Rock, uh, Johnny Rocket, uh, Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the best produced podcast bar none I've ever heard. Best libertarian podcast. I mean, I mean that, that period was such a fun period. We are libertarians. I always joke. We, listen, we didn't have a lot of facts. We didn't have a lot of information, but we had a lot of gut feelings and jokes, uh, you know, and, and I've sort of grown up a little bit since then and, and changed things. And, and part of the name change is to do a little bit sort of like what you're doing, where you get to a point where you want to talk about things like I'm still going to talk about libertarianism, but you want to talk about other things and how this because I mean, for me, so much of the early days of We Are Libertarians was about all the stuff that I didn't like about government. And I feel like that's a very like common thing for new libertarians. They don't like government. They this doesn't work because this government, you know, it's a lot of change, a lot of change, but we don't have a lot of hope, you know. And what are the institutions, the big private institutions that are going to to make a society function and operate? And I feel like you and I kind of hit that pivot around the same time where we're going all right, we get what we don't like, but who is talking about what we don't want to do or, or what, what we want to do as a society and how how you function in healthy relationships with other people? Like, how are we going to make society work in this day and time? I mean, what what kind of led you to that pivot where you kind of said, all right, I want to talk about just more than just like the libertarian philosophy stuff. What were some of those catalysts? I was I, I, I went I went through a really hard time in uh, in 2016 through 2018 primarily. Um, you know, I, I, I had a I had a head injury, which, you know, got me uh, got me. removed. Oh, okay. from, well, you know, means, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you have to you have to have you have to have something wrong with you to go through this. But like, uh, you know, I was dealing with a lot of personal stuff. Uh, I was losing campaigns. I was one of the first people to get you know, kind of corralled up in young voices. And because I wasn't contributing because I was just barely trying to graduate, I got removed from that because I just wasn't doing anything. I, for, for a good year, I didn't publish anything because I just, I couldn't physically, uh, mentally do it. Um, and you know, I keep, I keep trying to jump into campaigns and activism and, you know, I got to the point where it's like, I'm trying to do things that I think are going to repair my life overnight. And I think if you're thinking that you have to end the fed and bring every soldier home from overseas, and that's going to go ahead and drastically change your well being and everything overnight, uh, you're, you're kind of missing the, the forest for the trees really. And, you know, at that point, uh, you know, I'm broke, I'm flat on my ass. I, I can't, you know, I, I can't find work. It was difficult. I really had to ask myself, it's like, what am I doing? And, you know, I, I knew what I was doing. I know I'm good at digital marketing. I know I'm good at planning. I know I can do a lot of these things and people saw that, but, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I'm not happy with it, even when things do go well. And why is that? It's because I forgot to ask myself, what do I want to get out of this? And ultimately, it get it gets to the point where you really have to ask yourself, what what are you what are you doing, and why are you doing it? Because when the why became all these big things that not one person can handle, I really had to take it down to a macro level. I wanna I wanna be successful so I could take care of myself. I want to be able to take care of myself so I could take care of others. I want to take care of others so that way I can spread, you know good feelings amongst the people within my immediate vicinity. So because, you know, life is difficult and I genuinely believe that happiness is a choice. So, you know, I'm not a libertarian because I love talking about economic and theory, you know, economic theory and everything. And like I used to write white papers for fun. Uh, you know, I could I could go toe to toe with the best of them. And I have. But ultimately, it came down to if I'm not doing this with the end goal of actually achieving tangible results in my life, then it's not worth it. And, you know, I, I, I tell people uh, on the run is not a show for everybody, because if you want politics and you just want commentary, there are other shows for that. I call this like the advanced level course, like you already have the understanding. But what do you actually want to do? Because if you're not having more fun in your life, if you're not happier in your life, if you're not achieving more levels of actual individual autonomy and freedom and choice in your life, it doesn't matter how many times you lecture people or how many times you go about uh, voting or getting petitions for something. 
um, the, the real change starts with you. And that sounds corny, but ultimately I think that I'm, you know, I'm a testament to that because I've been able to do all the things I want to do for myself and for what I feel is for the broader liberty movement. But I've done it while at the same time achieving a lot. And it might not seem like a lot because it's not bringing down entire bad institutions and stuff like that. But it's a lot for me. And it's a lot for my friends. And it's a lot for my family. And it's a lot for my listeners. And I feel that when we refocus on just what is good about life itself, it makes everything big and scary seem less like that. And it makes big challenges and bigger dreams seem more attainable. Yeah, I think that somewhere along the way, I realized that libertarianism is not in and of itself the identity, you know, like, and I think that's why a lot of people get really bent out of shape. And there's almost like a cult around libertarianism. You know, there is a lot of cults around personalities in the movement. And every political movement has that because people are so bereft of meaning at the, at the moment that they're looking for any sense of community and politics is really a great way to latch onto that. But like, I love the libertarian philosophy because it helped lay those foundations for my own self-actualization. Like it, it, the, the individual responsibility that it teaches, the, you know, the, if we, if we didn't have these things, then you're going to have to do these things for this all to work, for you to work, for your community to work. Like, I think it's a really powerful first step for somebody. And I, I and maybe that's why a lot of like, Young guys who kind of feel out of control are attracted to libertarianism initially because it gives them a sense of like that 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 individual responsibilities that they're that they're craving that they're looking for and it's and it's uh, I don't know it, I, I don't know how you feel about this but I genuinely believe that person's political identity is the least interesting thing about them. Oh, 100 percent. But I think that that is often what a lot of people lead with because politics has become a form of entertainment, has yeah, become yeah. pro wrestling. You know, it's, it's acceptable to walk around as MAGA or libertarian or, or, or an Obama supporter or whatever. Um, whereas like if you're walking around going, I am the world's biggest fan of Triple H, <laughs> you know, like uh, it. I think with a lack of common things to talk about, like politics has sort of become the weather in the 1800s where people talk about the weather because they were farmers, you know, it, it's become almost a social lubricant, you know, and, and sometimes a friction too, you know, where people find like-minded people and build community around politics, but it, it can't, it, ha it has to like, it can't be the total summation of your person, your identity, your life. Um, and that's what I think, I really like about your show and, and kind of watching you from the Rimzo Republic days, kind of finding your own voice and finding your own way and kind of saying liberty's liberty is a tool for us all to reach, you know, this, this, uh, what we really want to do. Like I look at you writing, writing books, writing two books, working at the Washington times now with parlor. Like I've watched you kind of grow up into somebody that is, you know, maybe you haven't articulated or fully understood your dream yet, but you have put together a career where you're trying to achieve your goal, whatever that may be. Do you have like a clear idea? Like for me, I've always wanted to be a talk radio show host. Like that's been the long march from working at radio stations to working in media to working in polit political campaigns. Like that's been my march to where I want to be and what I want to do for a living. Do you have like a central thing that you're like, I'm going to do this and this and this to achieve this thing? Or are you just sort of like the dude that's like, this is fun. Now I'm going to go do this other fun thing and kind of have just tripped into to being good at these certain things. I, I, I was kind of like that until I realized I had bigger bills to pay. Then I was like, <laughs> I got to I gotta probably become more reliable. But I, I bring this up and this is one of the overarching themes for On the Run. Uh, this is really kind of like my recorded journey of my path to financial independence. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that one of the reasons why libertarians aren't more influential is because we're not fun to be around and we're broke and nobody wants to be around broke, unfunny people. And I get a lot of shit for that, but I'll say it until the day I die. And my, my biggest thing is, um, you know, I, I want to be in a system where I have the most amount of options in my life. 
Uh, they could be all bad options. They could be all good options. But I want them to. I want the final choice to be my choice because I had all options available. So it's my goal right now, um, through learning new skills, through developing, uh, you know, side gigs and consulting, which I do, by you know, growing my my overall, you know, human capital and by creating residual forms of income. Uh, I want to be basically retired by the age of forty. Uh, I think between the age of 35 and 40, I can actually be semi-retired. And when people hear early retirement or semi-retired, they think it just means, you know, sitting on the beach and not working again. No, I actually like working. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't do the podcast. I don't do my newsletter. I don't do all this stuff because it's made me a millionaire secretly, folks, like it hasn't. But, you know, it's all helping me achieve those things. People buy my books. People get my affiliate links. People come to me for uh, consulting because I'm giving them good, free, valuable stuff, and it's helping me grow that. So by being able to reach the point in my life where I can have enough of that to just cover the basics so that way I keep the lights on, food on the table, and, you know, live a, you know, just an earnest life. I can go on and I can do other things like, you know, everything I do has to do with trying to make a part of the world, at least from my view, a better place. Uh, I don't talk about it often, but, you know, I love this time of year because I usually have a, you know, a pot of cash and I do a lot of donations to charities. Uh, Samaritan's Purse is a big charity I really love. Um, you know, I donate to Free the People. I donate to, uh, you know, the Gary Sinise Foundation. If I could spend my entire life just, you know, trying to help out uh, charities either through through just donations or trying to find other ways to bring them in more attention, more of what they need to get things done. I think that would be beautiful. But, you know, right now the big focus is get myself to the point, work myself, to, you know, through to the bone while I'm young and while I'm capable. So that way I can spend the rest of my life doing what it is I love. And I think that, you know, it, it will constantly change because as people, we change. Um, you know, when I was 18, I thought I wanted to be a, an economist, you know, working for a think tank. And then at one point I was, you know, working at GameStop and I was like, I'm just happy to be working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, I think I need to give myself the freedom to have those choices and the freedom to do things that will fail and things that will succeed. But I'm not going to do it, uh, you know, having to work a full time 40 hour job well into my 60s. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. So, like, what are some of the ways that you are working on that goal of being financially independent? So I, I'm a big acolyte of the Dave Ramsey school of thought. He has the the seven baby steps. And, you know, immediately the, the big thing was debt. I got my debt in control. I don't have debt right now. I, I like, you know, unless something crazy happens, I'm, I'm pretty good. I've got my emergency fund. Uh, Dave Ramsey says uh, three month, three to six months. I've actually got an emergency fund for about a year and I keep putting into that. Uh, you know, I, I follow the 15% investment rule. Um, you know, I've, I've got a well diversified portfolio in different categories. So I'm doing all the things that I need to do with my money. But that's just what I'm trying to achieve through my earned income. Uh, you know, I, I write books. And I tell people don't don't get into writing books if you want to become a millionaire, especially if you self publish. But every month I get a pretty good check in the mail from that. And whether I'm going to put that towards gas or, you know, taking my girlfriend out on a nice meal, or I'm going to throw that into my Roth IRA or something, that's money that I made. And I didn't have to do anything for it because, you know, it gets to the point where you can only do so much promotion for your own books, but I'm still getting a, a paycheck from that. And, you know, I've got my old show, I've got ads running on still. So I get, I get money from anchor, uh, for the Remsen Martinez experience, Remsen Republic. Um, you know, I, I still do consulting. So I do a lot of nonprofit new media and political consulting for people. And, uh, you know, I'm at the point now where I don't really need it. So I could be more selective about the people I have because one, I want to make sure they pay on time because a lot of people are just cheap as shit. And two, I want to make sure that they're going to do it. They're not just going to waste my time and fight with me on it. It's like, if you're going to come to me, I want to make sure that you're actually going to learn and you're going to benefit and you're going to succeed and make money off of it. So I do, I do consulting for that. And, uh, you know, what, what I also do recently is I've been helping people start side gigs. Uh, I recorded an episode that's going to be coming out in the near future called Eight Steps to Building a Side Gig because I was inspired by one of my friends who listened to my show and got inspired by that. And now what he's doing is he's building computers from scratch and marketing them on Facebook Marketplace to parents who have kids that want to play Fortnite, but they don't want to spend money on a giant new computer. 
And I'm like, that's awesome. Let's let's teach you how to maximize that. So it's a mix of you know uh, expanding my 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 earned income from my day job, uh, building residual streams of income through books, through other shows, through affiliate links, through anything that I can earn genuinely passively without having to put too much effort in and then having the occasional side gig that brings in, you know, two to $500 at minimum a month. You know, it might not sound like a lot, but if I could put that directly into investment or directly into savings or buying a class or something else, like all I'm doing is I'm just growing myself. So it's trying to achieve all those different things, you know, earned, uh, passive, and then side income, uh, you know, trying to just keep that together, spend as little as possible, and then use it in the right places. Uh, I should be able to build up enough capital and enough regular streams. So that way, by at least, you know, 35 or 40, I can just say, I quit. And I know I'm still going to get money coming in. I think people listen to that and they go, well, man, that just sounds like a lot of work. I'm going to have to give up a lot of stuff. I'm going to have to eat rice and beans every day. I'm going to have to work really hard. Like, are, are, is that the truth? Like, are you are you tired all the time or is it, is it harder? Like, because I think if you're on the if you're 19 year old Remzo listening to that, you go, man, I could never do that. But when you're I don't know how old you are, like late 20s. I'm turning I'm turning 26 in a week. All right. 26 Remzo. You're like. I'm having a blast. This is a breeze. Like, what would you what would you say to the person that listens to that and goes, "Man, that's a lot." Uh, I, I I will I will cover this in two parts. One, everything you said is entirely true. It's difficult. I'm just I'm just gonna be straight with you. It's not easy. It's not always fun. And I did a lot of things to try and figure out what worked for me that that failed. And I think people need to understand that I failed at a lot more things than I have been successful at. I tried to do documentaries. Some of my documentaries did well. The first documentary I tried to do, I tried to do it with Ford Fisher. Uh, I had an Indiegogo and everything, it failed. Just, it, it was embarrassing. I tried to do other uh, podcasts about super niche areas. Those failed. I failed at a lot of things. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't find that to be too disappointing because I've learned from them each time. I tried to do an online course and that failed. Uh, what, what I had to understand was two things. One, what is the purpose? I can't just do this because I want to do it. And I, I mentioned this in the Eight Steps to Building a Side Hustle episode. Like, don't the, the worst time to create a side gig is when you're unemployed. <laughs> because at that point, that's money that, yeah, you're setting up for when you do find a job. You've already got your side gig established. But I think that's like ass backwards thinking. Uh, you should be focusing on getting a job. So, you know, it's understanding why. And the thing is, uh, you know, I have my base through my day job because your biggest builder of wealth will be your salary to earned income. That's just a fact. Um, but, you know, I, I have this all this other stuff because the goal is to not be doing this well into my 60s. I, I don't want to I don't want to be old. I don't want to be injured. You know, I, I brought up I had a hand injury you know, for a while. I still deal with the repercussions of that. I've got dementia that runs in my family. I don't know if I'm still going to be in my mental, you know, my mental facilities well into my 60s. That's scared. I, I, I'm scared of very few things, Chris. I'm scared of actually very few things because I've dealt with a lot. And the one thing that actually scares me more than anything else is living long but not being able to live because my mind has betrayed me. So I want to make sure I can capitalize on all the time I have. So that is my goal. That is why I work so hard now so that I can work like no one else, so I can live like no one else. And secondly, in terms of the things that I've been able to do, uh, you know, it's threefold. There are things I'm naturally talented in. There are things that I see an immediate market demand for that, you know, don't cost much time or energy. And three, there are things I, I, have, uh, I have fun doing. Uh, you know, podcasting, I tell people I don't do paid advertisers anymore, but I have affiliate links. All the affiliate links that you see in the episodes of On the Run are things that I actually use. I use Cash App on a daily basis. I use Robinhood myself. I use Dosh. I use all these things. So I want to share with you the things that I'm using. And the only way I benefit from it is if you use it. And if you don't like it, you know, it didn't cost you anything. So, right. you know, that that's one thing. So I, you know, I, I try and do it with the things I love. Podcasting is one of them. Writing books is another one of them. Uh, I do consulting for, you know, campaigns. I consulted for a winning campaign um, uh, this past general election for a state house delegate in uh, in West Virginia. So, you know, I, I, I do the things that I have experience in that I enjoy that I have a bit more of a degree of talent in than most people. 
And, uh, you know, I, I tell people, like, I think copywriting is probably one of the easiest side hustles you can get. If you can write good ad copy, you will never go hungry. Uh, I deal with many, many journalists who think that writing sales copy is beneath them. But let me tell you, when I was at the Washington Times, I wrote copy for uh, uh, people in Malaysia who do Botox, uh, you know, a Taiwanese family who owned a, a day spa in Ohio, and for people cr uh, creating educational toys for children. And it brought in good money, and it didn't cost me too much time or energy. So it's just trying to find the things that work for you, the things that you can do regularly, and it doesn't feel like a burden. And ultimately, you know that the time you're putting into it is bringing enough money later that you can use to help better yourself. Because I think we have a, you know, as Americans uniquely, and I don't like to America bash by a lot of people, I think you know, regardless, I, I don't know when libertarianism turned into anti-Americanism. That's just my opinion. But I, 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 you know, I think we live in the greatest country in the world. I'm proud to be an American. I wouldn't sell my citizenship for anything. I love this country, good, bad, and indifferent. But I think Americans have an extremely distorted sense of their relationship with their money because we're consumers. For every dollar that we make today, we're spending a dollar fifty. And we're usually putting on credit cards and we're just going to keep paying the minimum balance and we're never going to have this going. You know, the the debtor own. I'm sorry, the the debtor is owned by he who controls the debt. You know, we complain about banks all the time, but most people who are libertarians complaining about the banking system are owned by the banks and vice versa. They're owned by the people that are giving them the loans. So why would I why would I want to do that? So it's um, it, it's it's trying to basically achieve those things. So that way. Uh, we can make our money work for us because, you know, if we if we don't know how to properly manage our money and to make our money buy us back our own time, it's just wasted. And I need to go pay my my credit cards off. <laughs> fired here. Uh, no, I think. And that's, you know, that's uh, it's such a great point. And, and, you know, I've seen Roger Paxton, who was on the lava flow. He, he, I, I, you know, I knew Roger in the LP. And then he became a podcaster and kind of was done with the LP. And now he's done with podcasting because he's got his own self-sustaining farm. You know, he's, he's, he, he's like the point of Liberty. I think, and everybody kind of goes through this cycle, you know, when you're first into libertarianism or you're younger, you think you can change so many things. You can change the whole world, but at a certain point you kind of go, you know, at 37, I can barely change myself and I can only do I can only create generational wealth or something that is slightly beyond my person to, to impact society. Uh, and self-sustainability for an individual and their family is such an important part of freedom. And I really think that Dave Ramsey, for instance, is one of the most transformational Americans. His impact is so felt but not totally understood when we're in the middle of this recession and all these job losses and the markets and the economy all kind of seem okay, you know, and everybody kind of goes, yeah, they're printing a lot of money, but man, I bet there's something. And I'm just thinking of this as you're talking like about the amount of people that have spent 20 years preparing for this moment because they have three to six months, you know? And, and so it doesn't matter what the markets are doing. Your, your average American for the past three years has had less than $100 in emergency savings. Yeah. I think it's like um, one out of three Americans has more than $1,000 in emergency savings. Would you and say that is that, terrifying. Yeah, it's it makes you subservient to, to, to all kinds of different people. So love your message of freedom and, and independence. But you talked about writing, and I think that that is one of the most – underappreciated skills that more people need to focus on becoming a better writer has made me a better podcaster a better employee a better it's made me more money you know writing learning writing in my high school newspaper was the best thing that ever happened to me you know can you talk about your writing career and how important has learning the craft of writing been to your success uh, writing is the only reason why I think I've been able to receive a single degree of success because I'm not naturally talented at anything else. 
I call myself a pretty C average American when it comes to most things. I was just happy that I graduated college and they don't put your GPA on diplomas. So let's put <laughs> it that way. But what I learned very early on was that being an effective communicator is one of the few things that will actually help you get out of situations that you wouldn't otherwise get out of. Whether it's writing an appeal because your principal is mad at you or writing an essay why you deserve extra credit or writing an apology letter to somebody. There's something uh, unique about the written word and being able to speak with people, which is key. And, uh, you know, not many people know this. I had a speech impediment as a kid. Um, you know, I got my arth messed up, which is why, you know, if, when, when you call yourself Ramzo, it's it sounds kind of odd. So, you know, I had a speech impediment as a kid and, uh, you know, I had to work on how I, how I spoke and everything else. And, uh, you know, with writing, that was just one of the things that I, I enjoyed because I liked reading. I liked comic books. As a kid, I think I wanted to be a comic book writer. And you still have to write the scripts to give the artist. So if you don't write a detailed script, the artist is kind of screwed because then they have to do more guesswork. But uh, with writing, I got my, my start in writing in, a, in my freshman, I think, no, no, it was my sophomore year of college. Uh, Austin Peterson needed copywriters, and Austin, uh, he, was, he was just at the Libertarian Republic at the time before he got his radio show. So I just said, you know, I like talking about liberty and stuff, and I want a chance to write, and I don't know it where else. So I started doing that, started doing copywriting, started doing editing. Uh, from there, I went to Freedom Works, where they were, they, they were, uh, they were hard on the people that would write for the Freedom Works blog, and luckily, uh, you know, a very good friend and a mentor, Logan Albright, who actually wrote the foreword for my first book. I call Logan the man that helped me uh, graduate from college because he proofread and edited my thesis paper on a political economy, the feasibility of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Partnership. Yeah, that was fun. Um, you know, he uh, he made me a better writer because he's like, listen, man, if you could do this, you can, you will be fine at everything else. Get be get good at the hard stuff and the easy stuff will just be so easy and uh you know I, I started writing freelance because i wanted to you know just be a straight journalist for a little while uh just staying at mrc wrote for a few other places i was a copywriter for jason stapleton for a little bit and uh you know just whenever i needed work whenever i had a project whenever i needed money i just knew i'm good at writing so whether I'm doing research, whether I'm doing a fun listicle, whether I'm doing an investigative piece, I've done investigative journalism. Uh, writing always came as a as a knack for me, and you know I'm I, I I say this and I do genuinely mean this. You don't have to be incredibly smart to be a good writer. You just have to know how to put words together and how to make an argument and and cite your case. Uh, you know, there was a sting where I had a lot of very uh, labor intensive jobs. I was a mall cop. I was a uh, um I was a GameStop employee. Uh, I, I would sold makeup door to door, lots of lifting. It was bad for my head, bad for my neck. Um, you know, it just it just sucked. And I basically quit all that. And for six months, I was writing at the Advocates for Self Government. I was getting paid to do that, but I was also writing sales copy. I made more money from sales copy than I ever did from any of those jobs combined. And I did it from home in my air conditioned, safe environment where I didn't have to lift anything. And it just got to the point where I realized that, you know, I, I had a natural talent towards this skill, but what really impresses me are the people who identify as writers who are not naturally talented, but who became good because they respected the craft. And I tell people this all the time, and this has been statistically proven through entrepreneur.com and GQ and a bunch of other places. Copywriting is one of the most in-demand uh, side gigs in the world. And if you can be good at, co at copywriting, there's not just a local market. There's a global market. Uh, Fiverr.com is amazing. That's how I had international clients. I wrote uh, an entire website copy for a business in Mexico that built websites for other businesses. I wrote sales copies for clinics in Malaysia. I wrote sales copy for charter schools in Canada. I wrote sales copy for day spas in Ohio. You there? There's an abundance of work and there's an abundance of opportunities there's a deficit of writers so when i tell people especially journalists because they're like well it's beneath me i don't know if i can do it it's like if you can write hard op-eds and hard investigative pieces writing good sales copy just takes a little bit of time and effort and practice 
But I mean, writing itself, I think uh, for a lot of people, it's it's not just something that's good for marketing purposes and for self-development purposes. There's something different about actually writing your thoughts on paper. And I don't journal as often, but uh, you know, my this bugs the shit out of my publicist. But like, I, I have legal pads everywhere. Whether I'm just doodling or I'm just writing down random thoughts, I still use legal pads for everything. I'm a hoarder when it comes to that. I've got legal pads from years ago I refuse to get rid of because there's something about actually putting ink to paper that's a much more intimate and personal experience than uh, than just typing. And I don't like typing on Word or on Google Docs necessarily because it, it's too easy to let things go and it's too easy to backspace and to hit um, you know, autocorrect on this other stuff. I actually, I don't, I don't think I have it here, but I've got actually just a basic WordPress processor attached to a keyboard and an old e-ink screen. Oh, I'm, I'm so jealous. I, yeah, it's called the, it's called the free, right? It was like 500 yeah. bucks. I called it my money-making machine because I actually, you know, I did deferred payments for that because I wasn't really working at the time. So I had to do monthly payments for it, but I paid it off in like a month because it was such a distraction free utility. It doesn't have autocorrect. It does doesn't have anything it's just right bitch right and uh you know that thing made me so much freaking money i love I, I i want one of those so bad because i'm i'm so add and like you sit down to write and you you get pulled your brain gets pulled to the phone because you're like somebody probably tweeted at me and i need to look at that yeah you know that, that distraction free writing process so you've you've worked you know for for great people like AP and Stapleton, and now you're sort of in a role where you mentioned your publicist and you're you're hiring people, you're bringing people on. First, let's brag about the great Chloe and Agnos. Uh, we'll give her a plug. But also, oh, yeah. how do you make that? How do you make that shift where you're now bringing on people to? You're the Jason Stapleton that's hiring people to to do copywriting. Like, well, how'd you get to that point? And how do you you know you obviously now that you you've got these different streams, you can afford it. But I mean. How do you make that shift and what do you have them do and how, how does that impact your work? And, and I, I want to preface this. I'm not rich. I'm not. No, I think you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm rich in spirit. I see a Spider-Man poster spirit. without a frame in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I do want to give a shout out to my, to my publicist, Chloe and Agnos from Argo Strategy. Whether you're looking for social media, digital marketing, uh, editing, or just general uh, consulting and management, I, I've worked with Chloe for many, 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 many years, and she's always been awesome. Uh, she did a lot for my last book that came out, Has Succeed in Politics politics and other forms of devil worship and when it got to the point where i was just losing time in the day i realized i needed somebody to help me manage a lot of my personal projects outside of work because i just don't have the time for it and i you know my, my biggest problem right now is sleeping uh it got to the point where i realized i need somebody not because i just want to burn the money but because i need somebody to help me get back my own time so dropping X amount of dollars towards a publicist to help me do my marketing, my socials, and help me you know, do bookings and other stuff for the show, it's going to help me free up my own time. So at least maybe I can go to the gym. Maybe I can get a few hours extra sleep. Maybe I can work on another project that I've been postponing. And, and ultimately, I, you know, I feel comfortable with it because uh, ultimately money is just permission to take back your own time. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky that I have this reliable steady income coming in, not just through my earned salary, but through all these other streams that I can put it towards that because it's a, it's a, it's a great investment. And if you're doing it right, you're focusing on the things that make you money. So you make more money. So then it's like, it doesn't even matter. So it, it, it works out in that way. And, uh, you know, it's in my, in my side hustle episode that's coming out, I mentioned, uh, you know, understands your need for scalability. When your side gig gets to the point where you have to ask yourself to scale, that's a good problem because whether you're going to bring on more people to be subcontractors, whether you're going to bring on a virtual assistant, or whether or not you just see this as an opportunity to get more picky with your clients so then you can upsell the current people you have, uh, you know, understanding what you need to get back your own time so you can be a functioning, you know, uh, regular person who sleeps and who does all the things he needs to do. Don't forget to go to the grocery store, put gas in your car, that type of thing. Uh, it's worth it because the one thing that I have encountered that everybody encounters, and if you're listening to this and you're an entrepreneur, you know this better than anybody else, it's burnout. The If I burn out, I don't burn out for days, Chris. I burn out for months. It is like, it is like a, it's like a Dale Earnhardt crash. It is bad. <laughs> I get, so, I get, uh, of all things, I get laryngitis and it, and it'll last for weeks sometimes. Like there was a 
two month period where I couldn't talk and couldn't do the show because I go, 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 and you get burned out. And then your body, once the second you take a break, your body's like, gotcha, bitch, and gives you a cold. And then, yep. you know, it's, it is, it's really, I think our, in our culture, you mentioned consumerism, it's so geared towards, uh, make more money, make more money, make more money so you can buy more stuff, buy more stuff, you know, and it really just wears you out. It wears you out hard. So I'm a couponer. Like I'm, I'm cheap. Like ultimately, like it, it goes back to what I said earlier. You have to have a purpose with it. No, don't work this hard. Don't work this many hours. Don't subcontract. Don't add more projects. Don't do any of this stuff without an intention. And the intention is twofold. I do all this stuff because I have fun doing it. I have fun doing it so I can make money off of it. I make money off of it so I could reach my goals of the one thing I want, which is more freedom at an optimal part of my life. So if I didn't have that, which I didn't at certain points, um, it you know it, it would just become a disaster because you know like I mentioned, I failed at a lot more than I've succeeded at. You know, it's it's not it, it's just the fact of it. Nothing is worse than when you spend so much time and money into the stuff. And you know, like I, I made a digital course at one point. I, I did it in the worst way possible. I had to ask a friend for a loan that I paid a 50% rate of interest because I don't think he thought I could pay it back, which luckily I was able to. I had to take on more work to pay it back because the thing that was going to pay it back failed. But like, you know, it, nothing nothing is good when you have to take a loan from a friend at a high interest rate to make something that you put all this time and money and marketing and just energy into, and then it fails. Like, you know, when, when that happened, I had to go find other work just to pay off the loan. Yeah. And, you know, I, I say to people like it, you know, what, what's the reason for it? And the reason that I was trying to do that was because I was like, well, I'm unemployed. I might as well. I should have just been looking for a job. I should have been <laughs> I should have been going to the gym. I should have been resting, meditate. I should have done anything else than put all my time into something that might bring me not that much money during the month. So yeah, and I think it, intention. Yeah, well, there's uh, I got this nice note from a guy today. He runs Raw Liberty Media, look him up on Twitter. I'll give him a shout out. And, uh, you know, hey, how did how did you get, like, he asked, how did you get affiliate with the We Are Libertarians people? <laughs> <laughs> I just replied, I created it. And he's like, oh, I had no idea. I'm just new to all this. And, like, it's oh, such wow. a, like, and people always ask me, like, how do you get to the point where Remzo and I are at? Like, just start. Like, start with a thing, set up a Twitter, like Raw Liberty Media, set up a Twitter, then add on a podcast, then add on a website, make a bunch of mistakes, and eventually you'll get to a point where you've got something. I mean, consistency is key. You know, that's really, really important. And just try a bunch of stuff. If you're a young, young man or woman listening to this and you want to get into working for Liberty, then just start something. Get involved in a campaign. Send somebody a note and say, hey, I'd like to work for you. You know, and see what see what shakes I, out. I cold called yeah. so many people. Yeah, like and you know, uh, it's law of averages. That's the more people you reach out to, even if you're not necessarily the the shiniest turd in the turd bowl, you're gonna get a response back, and someone's gonna give you a chance. I've seen it myself. I've seen it from other people. People that aren't that bright, they just know how to go ahead and sell themselves to enough people, and somebody will pick them up. And you know, the more giggy all this gets, where everybody's working gigs. You know, it, 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 everybody's more willing to help each other out. And I just say, if you're a creator, share other people's content the way you'd like your content shared. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons that I bring on Renzo and bring on Brian Nichols. And I, I try to use my clout to lend it to them to help them get to where they're at because. Oh, like, I thought I was lending you mine, Chris. Oh, well, that's, that's, <laughs> but that's part of it too. Like you bring, you bring an audience from people that you've built and they go, oh, well, what is we are libertarians? You know, it's about working together. And, you know, saying like, hey, I've got this thing, go check out their thing, then it, it goes both ways. And then, you know, it, it octopuses out. So, and, I mean, and, yeah. And I mean, that's what I love about this network, because there's a show for everybody and it's never the same. And people just double down on what they're good at. And we are libertarians. You know, I remember when the when the Blaze and CRTV merged. I had friends that were part of that. Some got promotion. Some lost jobs. It's just how it is. But everyone was like, okay, well, that's how it is for the conservatives. What about the libertarians? And at the time, for, for my old show, I did an episode basically saying, like, listen, there's got to be a mechanism for creative destruction that builds people up. 
yeah. and not just tries to tear down other 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 efforts. And with We Are Libertarians, you know, I, I have had more fun podcasting here with this listenership, with this audience, with these other amazing hosts than ever before. Because, you know, the, everyone is dedicated towards creating good, genuine content and building each other up because, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. Yeah. Everybody's a worker. It's great. Um, yeah. I want to end on Parler because you've got this amazing job at Parler now. We didn't even get to the Washington Times. I had a bunch of journalism questions, but I'll, I'll ask. Oh, we you could speed better. through them real fast. Um, well, I mean, what is it like to work at a newspaper? I mean, the Washington Times is different in that it is a conservative leaning newspaper. It's created to be so, really. Um, but it, it was created to be counterbalanced to the Post. Um, but it's still journalism nonetheless. It's still a newspaper. You know, there has on the day that the CNN tapes are about to be released tonight and James O'Keefe is going to. I am watering at the mouth. Yeah, I, I personally will be shocked to find out if CNN employees like Joe Biden more than Donald <laughs> Trump. Um, this major revelation. Uh, you know, the uh, what's it like to work in a newsroom? What's a, what's journalism like as a career? I was uh, I was lucky. I started as a freelance journalist working for a couple of different places, getting to understand what it was like working with an editor you were never in an office with. And then when I was at the Times, I was a social media coordinator, but I also did a lot of commentary as well. Uh, it was the best newsroom I've ever worked in. I actually genuinely think it's the best newsroom in America because they kept their news and their commentary so separate. Uh, you were you like rarely ever saw a columnist talking to a regular reporter. And at the end of the day, the reporters I worked with there were some of the best reporters, I think, in the business because uh, they they just did the work. And often in journalism, you know, in the age of the Internet and news deserts and everything else, it's often really hard to get rewarded for putting the amount of effort you put into things. But, uh, you know, I worked with editors that were Democrats. I worked with reporters that were politically apathetic. Uh, you know, here I am. I came from Media Research Center at one point. One of our best Metro reporters worked for Media Matters. Uh, we were all there because we genuinely loved the news and the commentary we were doing. It wasn't just, you know, drive-by hit pieces. It was actually good, thoughtful commentary pieces that people began to you know, develop a relationship with. So, you know, working in a newsroom was great because it forced me to work with different types of people I probably would have never worked with. It gave me a 24-7 work ethic that you will never get. And to have done that, I think I was 24 when I started, to be so young and be in charge of the virtual presence of an entire news company, it was a, it was a great responsibility that I, I never went a day by without being grateful for. That job was the changing point in my life, really. So, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, get out of your comfort zone, work with people you wouldn't typically work with, grind like hell and earn their respect and just do what you're good at doing, which is providing great news and commentary and giving people what they want. And you will always, always end up on top. My sense of, you know, working around journalists and, you know, having been in newsrooms, it isn't that, that like the, everybody sits down and, you know, whatever we selectively find out about the CNN dump. I don't believe that journalists sit down and go, well, let's find this angle. It's more like a group thinky thing. You know, I, I doubt that the people at the Washington Times sit here and go, you know, get me a story on helping that that's going to help Trump, but it's going to hurt Biden. You know, I, I don't think that it's ever that kind of uh, explicit, but like when it comes to media bias, be it in either direction, I mean, what were your experiences around journalists as, as you worked with them? Uh, well, now in my current role, I really don't like speaking with journalists at all. I, I really don't. Uh, I've worked with some pretty scummy journalists when I was a journalist. But, you know, the thing about the Times, and I got this from one of the editors there in the newsroom, was um, good or bad, no matter who's president, no matter what war we're in, no matter what is the current trending hot button issue, those will all come and go. But the goal is to have the paper still be here. And the Washington Times is one of those unique uh, organizations where they've had really low periods and they've had really high periods and they've been able to stick it through each time. Because as long as you're just focused on the heart of the story, as cliche as it sounds, uh, history does look kindly upon that, ultimately. Whether it's a few months or a few years or a decade, I mean, ultimately, if you're just doing your job, 
you will continue to do it. The journalists I saw that burned out were the people that saw themselves as political operatives. That's not a surprise to some people. The journalists I saw were the ones that burned out were the ones that were just never in it. Because the problem is you had a lot of commentators pretending to be straight edge reporters and you had a lot of straight edge reporters that wanted to skip the hard work of actual reporting because they wanted to be commentators and talking heads. And it goes back to the intention thing. You know, living a life with intention is important and it sounds corny, but ultimately if you lose that intention you're gonna end up not succeeding at that because you've sabotaged yourself from the get-go so you know all, all the reporters i saw that wanted to be commentators they ended up doing that and they flamed out because they were just like everyone else and all the commentators that wanted to be reporters um you know it's going to be hard because you're not going to get that interview of that democrat because you wrote 10 hit pieces on him it's just a fact you can't do that so decide of what you want to do and uh, just be good at it because things come and go. Life moves faster than we think sometimes, whether we want it to or not. But if you just focus on your job, you'll be okay. So now you work at Parler, um, which, you know, as I've read in the media, is a right wing extremist collection of the most hateful people. A on threat to planet. democracy is a threat brilliant. to democracy. Um, there is no doubt that there, there is. Um, you know, a pro-Trump bias when you're on Parler, but that's sort of natural, I would think, with with any f social network that models itself on free speech, you're going to get people who who say, but one thing that I've noticed with Minds and Parler over the a period of time is a moderation of the people that start to show up. You know, you go on Minds and, and Parler, and it's no longer just, you know, like the guy that got kicked off of Twitter for being that guy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot more. It's a lot more people. How long have you been with Parler? What What have you seen just over the last? You know, I think you've been there a few months. It's been quite the the growth, I imagine. What What's going on at Parler? Give us a, a glimpse behind the scenes. So I, I was a Parler user. I, I have the little rocket ship badge, early adopter badge, since 2018. And when I was at the Times, I was a Parler client. Uh, I built the Washington Times opinion page on there, which almost has half a million people. When I left in July of 2020, it had about uh, 350,000 people. And um, you know, I've been at Parler as the outreach director since. July and ultimately what we want to do is we want to give people an actual social media platform that is what social media was supposed to be which is a place where people talk we stay out of their way unless they're breaking the law or something and we sell ads keep it simple we don't data mine we're not going ahead and uh, targeting people because of one way or another we have a diverse company uh, people that you know would, would probably surprise you I don't want to get into it but I mean we're all bound by the idea that you know, this matters <laughs> no, no, no. AOC I mean, writes copy for the email newsletters. I was surprised. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, like we, we, we've had in just the last couple of months that, that kind of, you know, that I call it the chill out as some would say, because we have a whole bunch of calendar models on there now because Instagram was saying their stuff was too scandalous. And by today's standards, it's not really. Uh, we have athletes now, MMA fighters. We have actors now. We've got, um, you know, Tulsi Gabbard is on there now. And Tulsi Gabbard, last I checked, is not a Trump person. Because ultimately what people are realizing is that you get rid of the algorithms that prevent people from growing a following and from getting their content seen, and you just treat them like actual human beings, it's amazing what could happen. Because what we're trying to do is just go back to basics. What makes social media great? And why was it good? And where was the problem? And people say we started off as a Trump base. It's because that's where we were in our climate when we started. We had those people here. So, of course, it was going to look like that. But I also like to use an example that Facebook was originally a site where the men at Harvard could go rate the hotness of their female colleagues. And now Mark Zuckerberg is on the Hill teaching old people how to use the Internet. I'd love to see like a feature where we rate the hotness of older <laughs> MAGA congressmen like Matt Gates versus Rand Paul. Obviously, Matt Gates is kind of hotter, but no, I'm his kidding. hair though. I would uh, love no. his hair. Um, I would love, I would love the locks and everything. I'll just run my fingers through it all day. <laughs> One of the interesting things is like right as everybody started, right after the election, there's always a weird thing that happens like right after an election is over. There's just always these little fluke things where like after McCain lost, all everybody joined the LP because like I did my duty and they lost and they can't get it done. You know, right after Trump lost, I don't know what it was, but everybody was just joining Parler and talking about joining Parler. 
Uh, I imagine that had to be like a crazy couple weeks. Your servers, I'm sure, were were hotter than Rand Paul. I mean, what what was it like just right after as everybody in their grandma it became like a meme in and of itself? Like, okay, Snowflake, go enjoy your safe space at Parlor, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know? I mean, I mean, pe- people people said a lot of things, but I mean, ultimately, it comes down to this: that we have a product that works, and everyone was seeing how tweets were getting taken down. I spoke with liberal reporters that said I was just doing election coverage, and Facebook, I'm sorry, and Twitter took down my stuff because they said it was spreading disinformation from sources that were not claimed and now she's on parlor because she could do her job as a reporter and we're not going to do that because ultimately you know the the product works you know we're not an editorial we're not in the business of fact checking things the the beautiful and terrifying thing about the internet is that it gives you what you want but that's the thing it's not going to give you what it wants it's going to give you what you want so if you want to go ahead and just focus on this small part of the world that's only going to tell you what you want you can get that anywhere but what parlor does is it ensures that you're going to actually have a platform to learn and to engage and to make your own mind on things we've got um you know reporters from the intercept on parlor we've got uh Rob- robbie suave from reason on there we've got maj Tory. we've got free the people we've got uh, americangreatness.com we've got ben stein we've got gina carano we've got people because they just want something that's good and treats them fairly because the thing is um you know when you come to parlor and you need help with something you're gonna probably get a real person when i was at the times we were not spending an insignificant amount of money on facebook and twitter ads and if we needed help it was like it, it just Possible. was was non-existent Possible. so we're, we're trying to remember you know we're not this digital rogue nation we're a business and if you treat your customers like crap it's not like they don't have options i would spend money on mines or parlor in a heartbeat over facebook at this point i mean you know it's i i never really got good results with facebook and i just don't you know having been banned before the 2018 election like seeing people like Hudak and and Joshua Smith and like normal mainstream libertarian people being kicked off of, of Facebook. I just think, you know, like I just there the, these Facebook groups are every bit the echo chamber that what people say parlor is. I've actually had some good conversations with people. I have better conversations with pro Trump people on my posts on parlor because they're more open-minded than I do on Facebook, where it's just more built for FUs, you know? And so I, my, I, I got 1.5 million on a post, views on a post that was not pro-Trump. It wasn't really anti-Trump. It was just, a, it was crazy that, that it happened. So um, how, do you, how do you kind of balance that out and fight that perception? I mean, is it, how, is it a problem that it's sort of seen as a, a right-leaning echo chamber or do you just go that's how it's seen right now and it'll balance out eventually i i mean what i usually see is that the people that are saying that to us they certainly don't have an account i mean (laughs) people are at the point now where they're just spreading just outright lies just outright lies that have no factual basis because if they actually did their homework and if they were actually intellectually honest they would see that it's a platform that is just that it's a platform um, you know, they, they are they are spreading things that I just find laughable on a daily basis because that's all they have to resort to. Because if there was something that was a significant issue, we'd probably respond to it by now, especially with CNN and, you know, not just American outlets. We have international outlets covering us. Uh, this has been one of the most overwhelming periods in my life because as the outreach director, I have to speak with everybody. I, I'll be honest with you, Chris. You're one of the only people that I'm going to probably speak to for the next year or so because i'm incredibly selective about the intention of the people i'm speaking with i don't really talk with reporters uh for parlor we have other folks that do it i did a webinar last week with the new york metropolitan uh republicans club um you know that was really more of an orientation i'm very selective about what i do now because even with on the run and stuff people are trying to you know bring me on to talk about the on the run topics but turns into something where i'm having to explain the parlor terms and conditions because they know if they can find a gotcha moment with me they can get some clicks for it and i i've got the, i've gotten to the point where i just completely cut those people out now um you know i've had to tell my my personal publicist that it's like i i'm not going to talk to reporters anymore it it's is sort of like the uh, the Jordan Peterson effect. Like, you know, yeah. people who have an – like Jordan Peterson is an innocuous 
harmless knockoff of Joseph Campbell. And like you read about him in the press and he's the most hateful misogynistic, like, and, and, and like if people write that kind of stuff about, let's say like Milo or Gavin McGinnis, everybody kind of goes, all right, yeah, I've seen some him say some ugly stuff. But like once it hits Jordan Peterson, you're like, that doesn't compute. That doesn't seem like this kind of guy. Like, you know, the same template that you used in 2017 against like the alt-right you know, Richard Spencer people, you can't apply that template to mainstream conservatives. It just doesn't compute. It doesn't work. And it all it does is just fuel that narrative of unfairness. And like, if you're going to be journalists, cover us fairly, have a conversation with us, as opposed to just like making up whatever story you want, because it's it doesn't yeah. compute to the people that use the product or listen to Jordan Peterson or watch Ben Shapiro. I, I I had the story. There's a there's a kid who wrote for Cassie Dillon's website, Lone Conservative, and he wrote two reviews, uh, one for each of my books. And the first one was nice, but he kind of ripped me a new one. But it was probably my favorite review because he, I know that he read the book, and right. that I could not actually argue with his claims because some of them were right, uh, some of them were valid, and I would still disagree. But it was an honest review. So then when he wrote a review for my second book, I actually went to him directly and I said, I like that you actually read the book and someone's gone get something out of this review that's honest uh, because they could smell a puff piece a million miles away. He read my second book and he loved it. And mm -hmm. I know that he did because I know what he's capable of when he reads something he doesn't like. And that's just a very micro example. But, you know, uh, I... I I, I have a very small group of friends now. Uh, it's really kind of gotten smaller in terms of people who are active reporters and commentators because I, I have to be more selective about it because now I'm looking at some of these relationships and I'm like, which of them are genuine friendships and which of them are going to turn on me if they can get a headline and go talk with uh, Oliver Darcy from CNN about how I'm a secret hate monger. Yeah. You know, it, it's all these things where it's like if anyone actually spends time on the platform you understand it's not these terrible things you say it is. And people are like, well, why do you have Alex Jones? And why do you have all these other people? It's like, they have a right to be heard. And if you don't want to listen to them, don't follow them. Block it's them. Not, it's not been my experience. Like I was on Gab for two days and I was just like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a, so I'm not going to be here. I don't want to be anywhere near Gab. Um, parlor is not that. And so you guys do have terms of service. You do have rules. You do have like, you know, I, I don't know why that's somehow been controversial from the other side where it's like, I can't believe that I got banned. Well, you can't say that and post that sort of thing. Like there are community standards, are there not? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't do things that are going to draw harm to people. You know, doxing is a big thing. Somehow conservatives freak out whenever a celebrity gets doxed. But I've had to go ahead and report many people for doxing people because that's targeted harassment. If you're doing something that can bring genuine harm to somebody in any form, that's wrong. And, you know, we, we, we have to go ahead and make sure that we have a we have a jury pool that assesses these things. So you're reviewed by your peers. It's not just an algorithm. Uh, you know, I, I, I the last time I tried to place ads on Facebook were for my uh, book, How to Succeed in Politics. And I had to go through uh, a, a pack disclaimer as a political page just because of what the title was. And I could never appeal that. So, I mean, most of the time we're, we're pretty lenient. We're the most lenient out there. And, you know, I get a criticism from libertarians saying, well, the future should be decentralized. OK, well, you know, once you go ahead and put something on a blockchain based system, once somebody puts child porn there, it doesn't matter how fast you're quick to censor it or do whatever. It's on the system forever. So there are pros and cons to all of this. But, you know, social media itself will never be perfect. We just think that we're the most perfect of the imperfect systems out there and we're constantly evolving. Uh, you know, we don't call our people users anymore. We call them members because they're human beings. And the only two industries that call their clients users are social media and drug dealers. So it's everything from how does the system work to how do we communicate with each other? It's the spirit of parlay, actually having a conversation with each other, actually having a place where you're you're equal under the terms of service, regardless as to who you are. And, you know, we, we had Jocko Willink join the other day from the Jocko podcast. Um, we, we've had, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Tulsi Gabbard. So, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to deny that, but you know, like she's the first elected Democrat on the platform. She, you know, she didn't have to come. She doesn't have to talk to these people, 
but I, I believe, and this is just my personal opinion, I believe that she's a genuine human being that wants what's better for people it might be different but you know i'm happy to have her because she's going to help make the platform a better place just by being who she is and uh you know my my goal in life i'm, I'm gonna get to a point in my life where i'm not gonna have social media it's gonna be a choice it's gonna get to the point where it's got to tap out but if i'm gonna you know complain about this and having seen how it was from a user and client perspective i might as well be part of the solution with a team of amazing people to go out and try and make things better so what's your par par is it parlor or parlay? I've heard both. It's parlor is the app, parlay is what you call a post. So okay. when you post something, you parlay something. Got it. Okay. So what's your username on parlor? Is it like Pulsey Scan 420? <laughs> <laughs> it's just Remso, R E M S O. I'm the only Remso there. Okay. And you can follow We Are, we are Libertarians on there. You can follow me. I'll, all the usernames for Brian, Trisha, Reinhold on parlor are all on the we are libertarians parlor you can follow our, our posts and and everything there it's so great having you on tell people where they can get the podcast and where, where you'd like to follow them and just general plug before we go all right everything and more we are libertarians.com man that's that's what i like to hear toe the company line <laughs> uh all right thanks thanks so much Remzo. no problem chris thank you so much thanks for joining us here on we are libertarians and we will see you again next week